So here are the three definitions of the dot product. Each one of them is great in its own context, and each one of them is perfect for its own applications. So the first one, the one that physicists use, and the one that we will use exclusively in this class as the definition of the dot product, is this one. Then, if you remember, in linear algebra, linear algebra does a fascinating thing. It turns the definition of the dot product on its head. Because linear algebra doesn't just study geometric vectors. Linear algebra studies all objects that can be added together and multiplied by numbers, such as polynomials and audio signals and vectors in Rn and so forth. That's what linear algebra studies. It needs a kind of dot product that applies to all of those vectors, to all of those types of vectors. Our experience with this definition will show us how valuable it is. So linear algebra says, well, if it's such a valuable concept, we want some of it. So in linear algebra, you define the inner product. But you can't define it this way, because linear algebra doesn't just study geometric vectors. Like I said, it studies all kinds of vectors. So it needs a definition that would apply to all kinds of vectors. And I have a whole series of videos on that. And so what happens in linear algebra is you observe that the dot product satisfies these properties. And actually, one more than the vector dotted with itself is always positive. And then you sort of realize that the more and more you, the more and more you use the dot product, the more and more you realize that you hardly ever use this definition. Early on, you use this definition quite a bit. But later on, you end up using these properties much more than you do the actual definition. So what linear algebra says is, whatever operation, with respect to whatever types of vectors, if it satisfies these three properties, the third one being positive definiteness, that something dotted with itself is greater than zero for if the vector itself is not zero. So in linear algebra, the position is that if you have an operation that takes two vectors and returns a scalar, and it satisfies these three properties, commutativity, distributivity, positive definiteness, then it's a dot product. In linear algebra, just to use a different word, it's called an inner product, and different, different notation is used, parentheses with a comma, just to distinguish it from the dot product. So in linear algebra, the inner product, an inner product, is an axiomatic thing. You don't give any specific definition, you just say it's any operation that satisfies these three properties. And that's what I mean when I say that linear algebra turns the definition of the dot product on its head completely. Instead of giving a definition and then, and then noticing its three key properties, it says that any operation that has these three key properties is a dot product, and let's call it an inner product, or a scalar product. And then in that context, this becomes one specific example of one specific inner product for one specific type of vectors, geometric vectors. So that's the relationship. So in this class, we will only use this as the, defini as the definition and this as its properties. In linear algebra, this is the definition and this is one example of inner product. So that's two approaches to the inner product, but you also know a third. You also know this. You're also familiar with this definition of the dot product, or inner product. You will open 80% of books on linear algebra, especially linear algebra for engineers. And this will be the definition of the inner product. And that's because the primary example of a vector in most linear algebra textbooks for engineers is an element of R3, A1, A2, a3, and then dotted with b1, b2, b3. So when this is your vector, you can define this operation and call that the dot product. So a third definition. So how do we put this or something like this in these contexts? 
Well, there's only one way to do it. Because if you want to use this kind of definition, you have to have components, you have to have numbers. Right? Neither one of these definitions has numbers in it as elements. This has directed segments, doesn't have any numbers, doesn't have components, it's just this. And this doesn't even specify what kind of vector it is. It could be a polynomial, it could be an audio signal, it could, could be an element of Rn, but in most of the situations it doesn't have, it's not a triplet of numbers, so you can't even apply this definition. So how do we make sense of this in the context of things that don't have components? Well, there's only one way, and that is to introduce a basis, which for us will also be equivalent to introducing a coordinate system, something, if you recall, we're trying to not do for as long as possible, and I think I'll succeed for a few more weeks. Introduce a coordinate system, and in the linear algebra sense, introduce a basis, decompose all of the vectors in the space with respect to that basis, and look at the components of the vectors. Now all vectors begin to look like this. And when they look like this, then you can apply this definition. So as far as I'm concerned, as far as these two approaches are concerned, this is not a definition or a property. What this is, is a component space representation or coordinate representation of the dot product. And there, and there are very many details, and not really details, very many big things to worry about. Because when you choose a basis or you choose a coordinate system, you have a great deal of arbitrariness as to which basis or which coordinate system to choose. And there you'll find out that your choice of the basis will dictate what this expression looks like. And this particular simple expression will be valid only if you choose an orthonormal basis. So if you choose an orthonormal basis, I'm just saying it right now, but we'll talk about it in detail later. If you choose an orthonormal basis, then yes, this becomes the component space representation of your vector. If you choose some other basis, some other kind of basis, it will be an entirely different expression. So you have to be very careful about this because this assumes a certain dot product or certain inner product in the context of linear algebra. And it also assumes that you chose a very specific kind of basis, an orthonormal basis, and this would not be valid at all if the basis was not orthonormal. Now, in defense of all of those approaches with linear algebra that uses this as the definition, well, that's perfectly valid. If you call this your vector, and guys like this are the objects of your study. And if you want to sacrifice a little bit of generality in favor of simplicity, which is a very reasonable compromise, then instead of talking about many different inner products and with respect to many different bases, you just choose this to be as your inner product with respect to whatever implied basis. And that turns out to be enough to illustrate all of the central ideas in linear algebra and still makes for a very rich discussion. So this is a perfectly valid way to teach linear algebra. It's just not our approach. We're studying physical objects in the physical world. Therefore, this is our definition. This are the properties of the dot product that we've established so far, and this is the component space representation of the inner product that will try to delay for as much as possible because my mission is to wean you off coordinate systems and to learn to think of geometric objects, of geometric vectors as perfectly mathematical and wonderful objects in their own right. I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>